So, Joel, thank you very much for making time. My name is pleasure, Dr. Hank. And before we go into the future of leadership, can you tell us where you're from and where did you grow up? So, uh, I was born in Johannesburg, but really grew up in, in Cape Town and then at about the age of 16 moved to Natal, so I changed schools. Uh, but, but really, you know, most of my informative years were in the, in the Western Cape. Went to a little primary school called Golden Grove, went to Rondebosch Boys High School for a while and then moved to Maritzburg College. Um, yeah, so that was it. Did uh, my military training, spent a bit of time at university in Natal and, you know, and then used rugby as a, as a wonderful vehicle to, to experience life, to travel the world, to, to learn about different cultures and different people and finally settled back here in Johannesburg. So as you grew up, was rugby always your dream career? No, so when I was a, a little bit younger and when I was at Rondebosch Boys High, I probably was a little bit more focused on cricket, actually. And um, when I moved to Marisburg College, rugby became a, a huge focus for me and it was very much a rugby school. And I think at that point also you know, came to the fore, my, my sort of talent, I suppose, came to the fore and, and I started you know, achieving some, some notable recognition. And maybe that's what propelled me into the world of rugby. And was there uh, maybe a person or something that inspired you? I think I think at that point in my life, I, my, my parents were hugely inspirational. Um, I think my, they were very encouraging. They were they never pushed. You know, they, they always wanted what was best for me. And sometimes, in fact, I think they may even have been a little conservative in, in their approach, in, in what they thought was the right approach for me. And, and at school, there were a couple of guys. There was one... You know, my, my coach at, at Marisburg College was a guy by the name of Dave Dell, who passed away a few years ago, but he was a, he was a hard man and a tough man, and I think um, that rubbed off on a lot of us. You know, you sort of learned how to cope with, you know, hard training sessions and toughness, and he, he, he made a bunch of schoolboys into, you know, young men. So your parents never uh, sort of imposed uh, uh, self-limiting beliefs on you? No, so they always they they always encouraged us to be the best we possibly could be to um, to you know chase your dreams. I, th I think there was a point where they probably were maybe a little more conservative when I when I finished school. My first couple of games, my first you know, I went straight into senior rugby playing against um, you know Springboks and 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 guys who'd been playing provincial and Test rugby, and I think they were a bit fearful for this little eighteen-year-old who was you know gone from being a you know a, a big fish in a little pond to all of a sudden being in a huge pond with the with the with the real big fish out there but i think that's life you know and you learn from those experiences and you you take them on board and if you're good if you if you're good enough you're old enough and in your life looking back at your career what would you say were the turning points um so I think I think every coach that coached or mentored me along the way was a turning point of some sort. They you know they they not only teach the the skill set and the approach, but but I think you learn mentally from from a lot of those guys. And and I think there were many turning points. And 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 I think there were hardships as well. You know, suffered a few injuries and you learn to come back from injury. You um you have you have big moments and you you know those moments sometimes cause your head to get a bit big and then you get grounded again something knocks you back down but but I think a career in sport is is not about one or two turning points I think it's a it's a journey that you travel and and at every corner there's a there's a turning point whether it's a good turning point or a bad turning point but it is a turning point you learn from and your big moment in 95 yeah that world cup winning kick how did that change your life so yeah, and I think it changed life for all of us at that point. It, it, was, it was just, I think, I suppose from a South African perspective, so much more than a, a, a sports event. It was a sensitive time for us, a time of uncertainty. We had um, the great man Nelson Mandela in our camp supporting us. And so, so it changed all our lives. You know, we got propelled from being little rugged players, little sportsmen who just wanted to go out and do the best they could possibly do between the four lines on, on the grass being propelled into proper celebrity status in a country that was looking for heroes that um, that needed to believe that you know success was possible that you know a nation could unite together whether around a sports team or in a, in a you know in some fashion to take a divided nation forward and 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 it did change our lives and we we um you know we became 
fam, you know, household names and icons o- o- overnight, and it was, it was fantastic in many ways. But it certainly, um, in the odd little way, it, 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 you know, I think the guys probably, probably didn't no longer had their privacy, no longer had their an- anonymity. They, they were propelled into the the spotlight, and for some of the guys, it, um, it didn't bode well. For most mm-hmm. of the guys, they've come through it in good fashion. So what would you say today? What is today driving you? So I think that intrinsic value that I've, I've, I've always had that was probably ingrained from my dad and my mum as, as a youngster still drives me today. I still want to be the, the absolute best I can be at whatever I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I, th- I think I have a burning desire to win, which is sometimes you know maybe a little too strong, maybe a little overriding, which has caused me... Um, You know, maybe, maybe that's why I crashed at the epic. I was, mm. you know, a lot of caution. I chucked caution out the, out the, out the, the window. window. But um, I think that burning desire to succeed is something that 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 is is in whatever I do. And it's not that if I can't do something well, I don't do it. I, whatever I can't do, I, whatever I try and do, I just want to do it, you know, to the best of my ability. And I understand at times that you can't be good at everything. You certainly. You certainly can't um, apply yourself because there's only so much time in the day at being good at everything. So you you have to accept your limitations and focus on on what you can be good at. But what I want to do, I do try and do to the absolute best of my ability. So let's talk about leadership, Joel. Yeah. What does the future of leadership mean to you? Um, so for me, it's and and I, and I, I suppose my view on leadership is has evolved over the years and in the last few years, particularly as a South African at the moment living in a country where I think it's it's a fair assumption to say we have poor leadership at the highest level. Um, for me, leadership is about setting a fine example and I don't think we, we see that today. You you know, if you're a leader, you have to you have to practice what you preach. You can't be preaching one thing and doing something else because that doesn't set an example to anyone. Um And, and in sport, leadership is a little bit different. You know, you have different styles of leadership, different types of captains. You have different types of coaches. Some some of those leaders, you know, don't talk a lot. They, they lead by by the example they set, whether it's a training or, or in the matches. Um, some to, some of those captains are good speakers and good orators, and, but they still have to set the example. And, and, and there's obviously, you know, the hybrid that's somewhere in the middle. For me, leadership is about setting the example that that you wish everyone else to follow and 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 if you can do that and you are the inspirational character you, you know people will follow and, and and right now I'm not I'm not sure we as a nation to have anyone to follow which is probably why we're at a, a little bit of a low at the moment and what have you learned from your own journey that you consider important for building future leaders so I think I think respect I think um, if you if you want to be a leader, you you have to you have to you have to obviously respect everyone everyone around you. You have to take them for who they are and what they are and what they're able to achieve. You need to you need to be compassionate um, and understanding, but most importantly, you have to be respectful. And and you know, there's some wonderful quotes about leadership. But but if you are going to lead and you are gonna, you have to set that fine example. But you have to do you know you have to live your life in a manner which is about treating other people the way you wish to be treated. It's about setting the example that you would wish to follow. Um, and, and, you know, leadership is about people. And, and we have a business that plays in the in the people space around you know, recruitment and career guidance and talent management. And the one thing I have come to realize is we are all very, very different. We all we all respond to, to different situations in different ways. We respond to different leaders in different ways and every leader is different, you know, and I don't think one leader will ever be the perfect leader for everyone, but you have to, as a leader, be, you know, the best leader you can be for for, for everyone if you wish to lead them. And and uh, it sounds, it's sometimes we talk about leadership in, in quite simple ways. I think leadership is very complex and, and, mm. and every day it gets more complex and it gets more complex because... The, the youngsters out there, the people who need leadership, have more access to information. They have more access to to what's happening. They um, they and on the back of that, they are much stronger decision makers. They make decisions in different ways. We don't always understand um, the people we're leading based on on the fact that they think differently, and uh, and that's where I suppose that respect and that compassion comes in. 
Now you are in a recruitment and career industry. So what do you tell youngsters they should focus on for building a future-proof career? Well, we, we, so, so our group of businesses plays in the disruptive space of which you know, that recruitment is, is part of it. And, and I just look at technology and I think about how fast the, the world is moving and, and it's all very well to look at recruitment, but I, th I think we need to be first, firstly cognizant of how fast um, the technological advancements in, in the world are moving, how much more data we have access to, how how you know the analytics engines are working to give us all more more and more feedback more and more to analyze more more and more to critically look at and understand where we need to go and and, and for a lot of youngsters out there I don't think their careers have even been defined yet you know if you think about the the young kids who are about to start school or grade naught or starting school next year in in real terms they, they, their jobs haven't been invented yet so 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 there's a lot to think about for for youngsters I I, I would say the The most important advice I would give to to those is probably twofold. One is life is not going to get easier. I think we grew up as as middle aged human beings. We grew up in an age which you know wasn't always easy, but it was certainly easier than the youngsters of today. They they are growing up in a in, a, in an environment that is fast moving, constantly evolving, ever changing, um, hugely dynamic. With huge barriers, you know, we as people, as human beings, we build barriers around whether it's culture or race or whatever it is. Um, the, the barriers. I don't think it's easy for the youngsters to grow up today. So, so when they embark on the journey of life and uh, a, a career right now, I would say to them two things: one, set yourself up for success. Don't don't set yourself up for failure by attempting to do something that you're not good at. Make sure you you embark on a journey where you can succeed. And, and make sure that journey involves passion because if we are passionate about something, if we, if we, you know, if we like what we're doing, if we, if, we, if we are happy at what we're doing, more often than not we're good at what we're doing, which means we're on that, we've set ourselves up on that journey to success. If, if you have those two ingredients, I've, I've no doubt you will have a, a, much, a much greater chance of achieving success and enjoying your, your career than someone who doesn't. Now, Joel, when it comes to technology, Which do you consider the key technologies that will be driving the leadership of the future? Well, artificial intelligence is the buzzword at the moment, and obviously, you know, blockchain will will define a lot of the the security, technical, technology issues in the background. But but I think we all have to be very cognizant of what's happening in the artificial intelligence world, where where machines will have the ability to replace human beings. Mm. They will have the, the the ability to make better decisions, which is where you know that process comes into some of um, you know our systems. We're seeing that already, but but so there is a risk, and I think if you if you if you read globally the the likes of Elon Musk and and some of the other real future thinkers, what they're saying, we need to be cognizant of that. We need to take into account what they're saying and and make sure that that machines don't take over the world, mm -hmm. that we don't empower them to do that, which which might, might not be a, a great risk now, but certainly down the line it will be. I, I, I think we need to find a, a sort of augmented solution between the human being factor with, with emotion and, and the ability to use machinery to, to help us get by in life. Now, when it comes to social media, which platform or platforms do you suggest youngsters should use? Oh, so I think it's, so th th that's a tough question, I think. I think um, we all have different preferences. Um, I think if you look at, at 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 Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter, Facebook, I think every every single one of those has a value of some sort. I, I, um, I'm I'm loath to recommend it as well. LinkedIn, I think, um, and I say LinkedIn, and I say I'm loath to recommend it because I get so many requests and it becomes a little bit harder to manage a LinkedIn profile if you really want to do it well. But, but every, every one of the social media tools has a value of some sort. My, my, personally, I prefer Twitter because it's short, it's succinct, it's to the point, it's 160 characters, boom, and it's out there. When you say it, you know it's out there. You can't withdraw it, which means you have to think a little bit about what you're going to say, which, which is, you know, the, I suppose what life is about. Once it's out your mouth, you can't pull it back in. And, and I think we all need to, to learn from that and, and understand that... That, that we we have the ability to cause pain and hurt by by saying things at times. Um, I, I you know my tweets go to Facebook as well. I'm not a I'm not a big follower of Facebook and I, I do sometimes read the news and articles on Facebook, but I'm not a 
uh, you know, someone who posts photos of my family and all of that, purely because I'm probably a little bit quiet and, mm. and, and I like my, the fact that, that we're a very private family. But for me, it's Twitter. For the youngsters out there, I, I think there's, I mean, there's great value in following things from a, from a pictorial type perspective and Instagram. I, I think it's really up to the individuals. Now, can you share with us maybe a success story or two where you mentored a youngster or you, where you were mentored maybe yeah. and uh, where leadership was really key? Yep. Um, so, well, firstly, I think every rugby coach I've ever played with has been a mentor of, 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 of some sort. As I said, my dad was a huge mentor mentor um, when, when I was young. Um, so I, I like to think back about some of my early coaching experiences where I coached that, that I, I saw you know, some real, real talent and managed to identify it. I, I coached a couple of young players at the Leicester Tigers where they came into the, the, the professional club as 18, 19 year olds and, um, and, I, and I realized how talented they were and I, and I trained with them and, and I was player coach so I still spent time training with them and I realized how, how talented they were, how strong their mindset was and spent a lot of time getting a couple of guys into shape who, who went on to become great, great internationals. Uh, well, firstly, one, one played a handful of tests, Leon Lloyd, but a really likable young guy. He's now, he now has a, a role in, in business in the UK where he does mentorships and coaches youngsters and does, does, does you know, human coaching, which is very cool. The other guy was Jordan Murphy. He went on to become one of the great Irish fullbacks, real talented player. Um, and, and wonderful, I think, as a rugby coach to to see someone come through and achieve something where physically they've stood up and matched up, but more importantly, where mentally they've, they've shown the strength to, to play at test level and, and, and you know, exhibit their talent on the, on the world stage. Very, very rewarding. I think for, for me, um, probably the, the, the mentorship I look back on with fondest memories is, is in the world of business was when I stopped playing rugby and I stopped coaching and I joined the, 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 the corporate world. I, I, I joined a company called Megapro and George Reitenbach was the CEO there and and uh, he'd probably kill me for saying this, but, but, but quite old school in a way, you know, real, but honest, um, integrity, hard, mm. um, hard businessman. But, but I learned enormously from him about firstly about nurturing relationships, about managing clients, about managing people in the workplace, um, about having fun, about enjoying life in the workplace, about you know the, the team spirit that you still build in a, in a business, in the corporate environment. And, and that's just outside of all the real business elements that, mm. that, that came with the program. And, and to George, I mean, I will, I will, always, I will always be friends with George and, mm. and, and we are still great mates today. And I will always be great ship, grateful for his, his uh, time and effort that he spent in helping me. So who are the role models you would recommend aspiring leaders should study and maybe learn from? Well, there's one that stands out head and shoulders above all, and that's Nelson Mandela, mm. um, for all the obvious reasons. So, so I, I mean, I've been, I was fortunate to, my wife and I were very fortunate to go to his house and have lunch with him and another couple, just the five of us. And I think at that point it was where... I realized the absolute depth of the man and the real nature of him. But it's not that dissimilar to, to the public persona. He, he, could have, he could have been a really bitter man. He could have been uh, a man who carried a proper grudge and, and, and took that out in, in, in the way he rebuilt this country. But he, he didn't. He was compassionate and he was kind. And, and it wasn't something he thought about and used as a tool. That, that was who Madiba was. And... To have spent time with him around a, a table, having a Sunday lunch, and to chat and to have listened to his stories and his thoughts, and um, th I mean that two and a half, three hours that we spent with him are probably mm. two and a half, three hours of of my life that will rank up there right at the very top, and will live with my wife and I forever. And and I think when we chat about compassion and respect and understanding people and respecting their views and their values and and what makes them and and leading leading them in a way that they connect with you. He was absolutely brilliant at it. And um, as I said, you know, to have spent 27 years in jail, to have grown up in, a, in a, an apartheid state where you are, you know, you suffer from being completely prejudiced against, it's, it, it, it's just incredible that, that he came through with such, such, a, such compassion and such kindness. 
So, Joe, where can people follow you? How can they connect with you? Well, they can follow me on, on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Stranners. Um, and on LinkedIn, I'm, I have a visible profile. And I, I do try and reply and, and, and uh, chat to most people on, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter, for that matter. If, I mean, if there are a few buffoons out there on Twitter who... If you don't like my views and, and give me hell for it, which which is fine. But but you know, just as I say, I, we we all have opinions. They they should rather respect me than run me down on Twitter. But but that but that's life. You know, when you're up there in the in the, in the glass house, yeah. someone's going to throw stones at you, and we we take it on the chin and we roll with it. And last but not least, do you have one piece of advice that future leaders should maybe implement in their own lives? So I, I do, and, and I have a charity that spends, spends um, you know, we raise money and every cent we raise goes to underprivileged children and their educational needs. And so for me, the, the leaders of the future have to make sure that, that we, we educate our youth, that we empower them, and that we set an example, that we, we lead by an example that, that ensures that we all respect each other, we respect each other's cultures, we respect each other's backgrounds, And most importantly, we are ethical and set a fine example for those coming through. Well, Joel, thank you so much. You have been inspiring us for decades by now. And uh, thank you so much for building the future. It's, it's only with pleasure, Dr. Nick. It's, it's nice to be in interviewed and it's nice to actually uh, be part of what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>